The, the title, Amanda, is Ever, E-V-E-R. Hey, Gene. Hey, Brother Derek. First Thessalonians 4. All right, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. If Paul doesn't want the Thessalonians ignorant of this, nor should we be ignorant of it, obviously. And a lot of people use First Thessalonians 4 to preach funerals, which is great, but they also don't believe the doctrine of it. First Thessalonians 4, 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw are not even as others which have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And obviously the sleep in Jesus is somebody that's trusted the gospel of their salvation and have been sealed and they left this world in dying. Okay. All right. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, under the coming of the Lord should not prevent them which are asleep. And we'd have to understand prevent what? Well, prevent them from rising from their sleep. Uh, verse 4, 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, comma, with a voice archangel, comma, with a trump of God, colon. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, if they're asleep in Jesus, then they would have to be up asleep. And if they rise, they rise from their sleep. And it's very clearly telling us that because we're still alive, we're not hindering that to happen. It can happen right now. And I try to tell people, I say, you better be ready. It could happen at any time. We don't know when, but it can happen at any time. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together with them. Why, they're with the Lord. So the only people that can ever be caught up alive and meet those that sleep in Jesus is us right now. If we go on in, in dying, then we go to sleep in the Lord. We go up there with Jesus. We're absent from our body and present with the Lord. But whoever's here alive will be the only people that can meet the Lord in the air. That's, that's not been preached in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's not something that's known until Paul reveals this thing to the Thessalonian letter. All right, now verse uh, 17. Then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in there, and so shall we, and here it is, ever, uh, ever be with the Lord. All right? The word ever means at any time, always. In other words, being alive doesn't mean that we're not with the Lord. Uh, go to the book of Ephesians chapter uh, 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened. That means made alive. We were what it says. Let's see what it says. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. So being dead in trespasses and sins, because of what Adam did, he is our heritage adam is our heritage romans 5 12 wherefore as by one man adam sin entered the world and death by sin so death passed upon all men for all of sin so no matter who we are what race we are what color we are when we're born we're under the inheritance of sin and sin equals death okay so no matter what a person does how good or how bad he will die. His body that he lives in, called a house, he will die because of how and who he's born of. All right? God will fix that for us. He fixed it in a way that you can only explain by the scriptures because you can't feel it, you can't see it, you can't touch it. He fixed it in a spiritual manner. Now, watch in verse 1 again. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, that's the God of this world, that's Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, not only is he called Satan, Lucifer, dragon, and other things, he is a spirit. He was created 
He's a fallen angel. He's created. He's a spirit. Angels are spirits. And so this spirit works in the children of disobedience. Why? John 8, 44 said that when he, uh, when he speaks of the devil, he said he was a murderer and a liar. He was a murderer and began. He murdered mankind. He got mankind killed by the temptation in the garden and the subtle uh, working on Eve to get her to eat of the fruit and Adam to eat of the fruit. And thus the whole world born through them from then on is going to die. Okay. God's dealing and dealt with our reason for dying. Our reason for dying is an inheritance. We are inherited because we're children of disobedience. We're not disobedient children. We're children of disobedience. The way it's preached most of the time, if you clean up your disobedience, then God will deal with you. That's not what it was. We're born children of disobedience. Anybody in this world, I don't care how good they are in this dispensation of grace, are going to die whether they're obedient or not. Obedience in the flesh don't get you to heaven. Obedience to what God did gets you to heaven. We might look at that in just a minute, but verse three, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of flesh, uh, of desires of the flesh of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Children of disobedience are children that are naturally born. A natural born child is a child of the disobedient one, Adam. Okay, so that makes you a child of disobedience. Okay, being a child of disobedience, you will get wrath if God doesn't intercede. Okay, verse four, but God who is rich in his mercy, in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace are you saved and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now that has to be spiritual because we're sitting here, we still have the nature of sin, we do sins because of our nature, we are still in the flesh in the sense of living. Now turn to Colossians with me, and it's, as you read this, you have to believe it by faith, all right? Colossians chapter two, because you don't feel it, you don't look it, and you don't sound like it, okay? Colossians chapter two, verse 10, and you are complete in him. Now, if you read that verse with me, and I, I recommend, I'm gonna read again, you read it to yourself, but read it. You are complete in him. Thus, if you're reading that, will you believe it? It's written, you're complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers, in whom also you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, okay? You have been circumcised some form or fashion. We need to find out about it. You are circumcised in a manner that you, male or female, are not going to have it done to the flesh. Now, you, I want you to understand that. Circumcision in the Old Testament was done in the flesh of a male foreskin covenant the foreskin cut off was the token of the covenant this circumcision here male or female has nothing to do while you're living in your flesh except that you must believe in the operation of god that he did and showed you in his book for you to believe it and walk in it. I don't know how else to say it. When you walk in the fact that, yes, God, you said I'm complete, I trust you. Yes, God, you said I'm circumcised, I trust you. And circumcised with a circumcision made without hand and putting off the body of the sins of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. God had Jesus circumcised the eighth day by Joseph and Jesus' mother. They were righteous people in the fact that they followed the law. They took Jesus in the eighth day, had him circumcised. The priest circumcised him, and thus he's under the law, made under the law. He lives his life in obedience. He has the blood of his father, which is God Almighty, virgin birth. 
He is not born of Joseph. He's born of Mary, born of the Holy Ghost that overcame Mary of God. And he lived his entire life in obedience. By being obedient, he does not have the nature of sin. And if he doesn't have the nature of sin, he will not die. Now, get me. If he doesn't have the nature of sin, the inheritance of sin nature is death. Jesus does not have the inherited nature of sin. He is obedient child, thus he shouldn't die. Why does he die? Because God in his plan had made him in the flesh to eventually die. Why would he die? And the knowledge that Paul gives us is he died for our sins. Now get a hold of this. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. This all is done in Christ. It has nothing to do with our physical body, except we in our mind believe that God did this in Christ and has applied it to us when we hear it and trust it. When we trust it, God seals us with that spirit that Jesus gave up at Calvary, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He gave up his spirit. He died. When he died, then his death would be applied for our sins. He would go down into hell, spend three days in hell. He would raise up. When he rose up, God justified, forgave, glorified, made us righteous in him, made us a new creature, not the old man. The old man was crucified with him. The old man is dead in God's mind, and he wrote it down. You and I have to believe that. We have to trust that to have it applied to us. Once it's applied to us, now let's read on, Colossians 2.12, buried with him. And by the way, in verse 11, ladies, in the Old Testament, you couldn't get circumcised. You were in a household and hoped that the husband was circumcised. Thus, the household would be in, in accordance with God's word. You are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the fact that God cut you away in his body, in your body, in his mind. He did it. He cut you away. You went down with Christ. Now watch verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. Baptism of death, Luke 12, 50. You were baptized into death. And when you went into death, that means that you were cut away from your body and what it did, are you listening? And went down with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Lord raised, he took you up to God the Father and presented you holy and without blame before him in love. Amen, that's great. Grasp a hold of it. Now watch, verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith, the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. When Jesus rose, the operation of God took my Lord and your Lord, the Jesus Christ that we're talking about, through death. When he was on that cross, he was us. God's accepting this type of sacrifice. Jesus is without sin. God makes him to be sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Go there, 2 Corinthians 5. I know this is simple, but it is necessary. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he, God, had made him the Lord to be sin for us. Jesus was not sin. He was made sin for us. Why? He's a sacrifice a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God, a holy sacrifice, but he's a man. Thus, a man died for mankind, not an animal. The blood of animals only cover the sins and put them in remission. A man, turn to 1 Timothy chapter uh, uh, 2. 1 Timothy 2. 
verse four, who, that's God our Savior, verse three. Now understand, God is our Savior. Salvation belongs to God, belongs to the Lord, Psalm 3 eight. And belonging to God, God will do how, whatever he wants, however he wants, but it'll always be done in righteousness. The righteous act of God was to make a sacrifice for us that he would accept for what we are dying, what we did sins, and for our resurrection justification. The gospel of our salvation is very clear in 1 Corinthians 15, but I want to read this and I know I will there. 1 Timothy 2, 4, God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what you've done in life. It was God's will to save you. But he can't just save you. He's God. He can do anything he wants, but he does it righteously. And he wasn't going to just save you because you got good or you asked Jesus in your heart or turned from your sins or gave your life to Christ, all that. That's your works. He saved you by the faith of Jesus Christ and by his work. The work that God did was workmanship. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We're for he, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. When he made him to be sin, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. He made Jesus to be sin for us someday. He didn't make him an angel. He didn't make a man that would sin. He made a man that would obey. Now, Jesus had the right. I mean, Jesus could have sinned. Jesus could have disobeyed and everything would have been haywire. But no, sir. Jesus' son is obedient. And the last Adam is obedient. The first Adam was disobedient. That's our daddy. The second Adam, the last Adam, and it says last Adam, the last Adam became our savior because it was his father's will to save us. It was God's righteousness. It was God's way of saving us. And it doesn't matter what people think, and it doesn't matter what people are doing, and it don't matter how churchy they are, how good they are, how they don't do this and do that. It has nothing to do with this. God in his righteousness, let his son become sin. In other words, he took what Adam caused us to have and then let him die for our sins, according to the scripture, and be buried and rise again the third day, accepting the sacrifice of Ephesians chapter five, which was the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, sacrificing himself. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And Thessalonians is talking about being delivered from this present evil world. Do you understand? Ever. Now let's go on again. In 2 Timothy 4, uh, 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, and the man Christ Jesus. And people all over the world are not coming to God in their own way. There is one way. And that way is the gospel of Christ, what Jesus did, what God the Father wanted. It was God's will. And Jesus was willing to do the will of the Father to give his right of living to be killed. And then when he got killed, he went into hell, spent three days in hell. And God the Father forgave us because of the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ greatest message that was ever recorded in the Bible. But now watch verse five, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus as a man met the temptation of the devil in Matthew chapter four, head on, never said, I believe he said it's written. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are yet knew no sin. Jesus faced off with the elite Pharisees. He faced off with other people. He did not do anything wrong. He fulfilled all righteousness. Thus, that man 
who is all righteous became sin so that God, he was made sin, so that God could make us righteous, a vessel holy and without blame. Look back in Ephesians chapter one. You see, people are denying what God did by confessing of sins. God never told us to confess sins. How can a dead man that's a new creature confess sins? It, it won't work. Jesus died for our sins. All right, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according to he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is what God says. So as you're reading this, are you going to say to God yes? Or are you going to say no? If you say no, you'll be like Peter. No is a word of the devil. And when Jesus told Peter, he said, I'll be delivered up, suffer many things, the chief priests and elders, be crucified and rise again the third day. And Peter said no. And the Lord said, get behind me, then Satan. The word no to whatever you read, if it's written directly to you, if you say no, you're saying what the devil wants you to say. You see, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You're a new creature. Are you willing to accept that and be happy with it? Are you going to try to make it more perfect? Are you going to try to live and the old, uh, what would Jesus do? He already did it. You see, I've never met a good person. I've never met a righteous person. I've never met anybody that understands. If I meet a good person, he's good in Christ. If I meet a righteous person, he's been made righteous in Christ. If I meet a man that is trying to do the best he can, I have nothing against him but he's still got to know unless he's in Christ, it's not doing any good. Now watch 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Passed away is a word we use for people dying. Go to Romans 6 and watch. I know this is simple. And folks, we got people on here that may not have ever heard it. In Romans 6, I will never, Lord willing, Creek don't rise, and I don't go nuts, ever be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Read it with me. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. It doesn't matter if you lose the body you're living in. God bought the body, and so while you're alive, you can walk in Jesus' good works, giving him the glory and giving him the credit. But if you lose that body, that's the preciousness of 1 Thessalonians 4 we read. If you lose this body, 2 Corinthians 5 says, you have a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And you leave this world. You leave this old body that continues to sin and want to sin and gives you a problem all the time. You leave this body because you've been groaning within yourself to leave it for Oh, as long as you've known the Lord and trusted him in Romans chapter 8, verse 22 and 23. And when you leave this body, you're going up in a redemption of a sleep. And asleep up there, you're resting and you don't have to worry about nothing. You don't know nothing. You're asleep. And then God wakes you up. And when he wakes you up, he says, we're going down to get those which are alive. The ones down that are alive did not hinder Jesus waking those who were asleep up. There's no hindrance there. That's what he said. We don't prevent them. So God can choose any time he wants. Wake up those that are asleep in Christ. Bring them down. We which are alive remain should be caught up together. But who's, a, who's alive and remain that he knows? Those that are sealed with that Holy Spirit promise after you hear the gospel of your salvation. Now watch. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you're saved. Saved from what? Saved from dying. Saved from death. 
not dying physically. That happens. That happened to Paul. It's happened to all everybody through the centuries. But that's not death. Death and hell are in a place that the only time they're going to come up is Revelation 20. And when they come up, they're going to be judged and cast into the lake of fire. Jesus Christ saved you from being naked without a body, your soul in hell. You can't go to hell if you trust him. He already went there for you. Now watch. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 2, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to Scripture. The greatest words in the Bible. Someone else died for my sins. His name was Jesus. Why did he die? God made him to be sin so that he would die. He applied that death for my sins. He took my sins away. They're gone. They're burnt. He took me with him. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Well, Paul, you're alive. How can you be crucified? Again, this comes down to, can you read this? and believe it happened to you. You're reading the verses that say they did. Uh, the Lord said, you're crucified. Your old man been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. God doesn't need your body. Besides, the older you get, the less the body can do. And one day the body will just perish. But the soul and spirit, the spirit belongs to God. It'll go back to God. The soul is what Jesus Christ bought for a ransom. He gave himself a ransom for all. The wages of sin is death. And there's so much involved in that. Death as far as physically closing your eyes. Then your soul must go somewhere. Jesus' soul went into hell so that you won't go to hell. Then he arose so your soul would go up with him. When the time comes, you need your soul to be alive. But when the time comes, if you go to sleep, your soul goes to where Jesus took it in the sense of God's mind. If you're alive, your vile body can be changed, fashioned like unto his glorious body. Why? Because the spirit of Christ is in you. That sealed you. That identified you. It's not that God doesn't know you. He knows you because he sees the spirit of his dear son in him. You don't look any different or act any different than most people. You try to do good. I understand that. Grace people are good people in the sense that they try to do good, but they're no good either because there's none good, no, not one. Well, how can God identify you? He sees the spirit of his dear son in you. How did you get the spirit of your dear, uh, the dear son in you? You heard the gospel of your salvation, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. You trusted it and actually you believed it. What you, what you believe, you trusted. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. God gave us an inheritance so that we wouldn't die death. Our inheritance in Adam is wrath. If we're alive, our inheritance in Adam is death if we lose our body. Our inheritance in Jesus in the house of God is that we cannot go into death. We cannot our lives see the wrath of God, Romans 5, 9. Therefore, being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I mean, it's all clear in these verses. I would go with through you every verse with you if you want me to later. I got time on a Bible study. But all you have to do is read Paul's letters and you see all the things I'm talking to you about. And I think about Galatians again, chapter 2, verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ. I don't feel crucified, but I am. And that's what God said I am. Paul said it. I follow what doctrine that Paul preached. I believe the gospel that Paul uh, uh, preached. I believe Colossians chapter 2, I'm complete in Christ. Why? God said it. God can't lie. I'm going to take it for the face value of what it says. I'm crucified. So place yourself in this. I am crucified with Christ. 
Now, we're, we're not going to say, Paul, I'm going to say you. I'm going to say, I am crucified. That's me talking. Okay, read the verse. Put you there. I am crucified with Christ. Are you reading it? You. You say, I am crucified with Christ. You're inferring to yourself. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Obviously, we're alive. Okay? Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Turn to Romans chapter 8 and watch. In Romans chapter 8, beautiful thing. Most people in church, most people in religion are trying to clean up their flesh. Clean it up. How would you clean it up enough to take care of your inheritance. You have to be adopted to lose your inheritance, your natural inheritance. When children are born, sometimes their parents get killed and they don't have any relatives. So they go into a uh, home, a uh, child care home, and they are looking for someone to come and adopt them. And that means when they adopt them, they'll change their name They'll get the inheritance of that family and on and on, okay? Romans 8, verse 8. So then that are it, they, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So as long as you're alive, and that's all, physically alive, you cannot please God. But if you have been crucified and living yet with Christ in you, then you can do the work of God. Now what? Hold this. Go back to Galatians, uh, Ephesians. In Ephesians 2, now remember Romans 3 said, there's none that doeth good. None. In Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We are not born. We are created. We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The good works is believe on him whom he has sent. Believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that God Almighty is Savior and Father, one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The only testimony I can give you is that Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all. No, back in Romans 8. So then they that are in, uh, in the flesh cannot please God. Now here's something you're going to have to believe that God said without feeling it. Verse 9, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, now listen, the body is dead because of sin. Your natural body will die. Unless God calls the asleep in Christ and wakes them and comes down for us that are alive, you will lose this body. But it's a body of sin. Now watch. The body of sin has been taken care of. God doesn't see you in the flesh. Isn't that the coolest thing you've ever thought about? Look, hold here, go back again to Ephesians chapter 2, verse one, uh, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good work, which God before hath ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according to his chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us on the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Back to Romans 8. In Romans chapter 8, verse uh, nine, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Clean it up. Deny it. Sacrifice 
things and not do it, and it'll still die. It's like a lot of people go on special diets because they don't want to get unhealthy. That's great, but you're still going to die. You do it so that you can live healthy and live a longer life. Nothing wrong with that. You don't want to live in pain or in misery. Nothing wrong with that. But you still ain't going to help you live. Yeah, you're going to die. And you know what? I always told people, we can be healthy. I used to go to the gym a lot. There's nothing wrong with that. I used to hate you eat health food only. Nothing wrong with that. But wouldn't it have been a rip if I got run over by a car and I'd have still died? You see, if you need to live healthy, live healthy. If you need to live and deny yourself stuff, do it. But don't ever count that that's going to keep you from dying. It ain't. Don't ever count your youth as keeping you from dying. It ain't. Don't count nothing to keep you from dying except that someone else died for you. Trust him. Folks, they couldn't have been any other way or God wouldn't have done it. God wouldn't sacrifice his son if there was any other way. God would not have sacrificed Jesus if you could have got good enough to come to God. That's foolish. God didn't let his son die so that you would have to confess your sins. God took care of sins. God took care of your destiny of inheritance of Adam. He adopted us. And in that adoption, he gives us a spirit of adoption. And bless your soul, look with me in verse 15, uh, Romans 8, 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You have the right to call God your Father. And when you call him Father, it's because he allowed you to. Why? No man come to the God except uh, no man come to God except through the Son, and no man come to the Son except the Father draw him. And God saved a man one day named the Apostle Paul, and he became our apostle. And the first thing he began to do was preach the gospel of our salvation. Simple gospel. What is it? Christ died for our sins according to Scripture and was buried and rose again the third day, of course, scripture. If you can trust that and never worry about it again, it's because God sealed you. And God sealed you, and he will bear witness that you're a child of God. He will hear your prayer through Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 26. We don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. My lousy prayers, my wrong said prayers, my evil thought prayers don't mean nothing. You know why? Jesus intercedes for me. Why? Because I'm an adopted child. Why am I an adopted child? Because I have the spirit of the dear son in him. Being an adopted child, I'm not in the flesh. I'm in the spirit. Turn with me to Ephesians one more time and hold on to Romans 8. In Ephesians chapter 1, tremendous verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. That's what you read in 1 Thessalonians 4. Even, uh, verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Well, what inheritance? Hold there, flip back to Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How? The word of God itself says so. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Once you trust the gospel of Christ, once you're sealed, you are an enemy of the God of this world. And he will do everything possible to make your life miserable, to make you get corrupted in your mind, to make you feel guilty, to make you look at things and wonder why things aren't going the way you want. And all along in Romans 8, look what it says in verse 36. As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Why would God let his children be that way? Because in their suffering, they look for their father. 
and they need their father more than they've ever needed before because their father will never leave them and they have an inheritance. And as they live on this earth, they're giving glory to God and the son, Jesus Christ. And in doing so, the God of this world hates them. He hates me. He hates you if you're saved. He does everything possible to come after you. And when he comes after you, he'll do his level best to discourage you, to hinder you, whatever he can do to get done, to stop you from walking in Christ's good works, being a testimony. I was reading this to him the other day. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prison of the Lord beseech you all worthy of the vocation where were you called. If you don't know your vocation, maybe you ought to read Paul's letters and find out your vocation. But in your vocation, God will make all grace abound towards you. He'll give you a measure of grace. He'll give you a measure of faith to do it. And here's why well, you're supposed to walk in your vocation. Verse three, in there, uh, uh, verse two, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. You know what is, you know, the hardest thing in the world is to take it not dish it out, to take it. When people come after you, just take it. You know why? They may not know what they're doing, but not only that, they may be led. Lost people hate us. Why? They hate believers, just like the Pharisees and the upper muckety-muck hated Jesus, just like they hated John the Baptist, just like they hated Peter and the apostles, just like they hated Paul, my Paul says in Philippians, not only give a hat to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. So as you walk in the vocation where you're called, it's with meekness and lowliness. Uh, I'll read it again. In, in lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Sometimes people don't even know what they're doing. It's a terrible thing what Satan can do. But you know what? It's a great thing what God did. God called a miserable wretch like me and saved me by showing me the gospel of Christ and I could trust it. Then he called me to preach. Why, Lord? Because I believe and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you? If you don't know the gospel, look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse three, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. I ask a lot of people sometimes, I say, what's the gospel of Christ? Uh, Teresa Carr, who's on right now, her brother, he thought he was safe for years. And one night, I was having to deal with a man in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and I had to go. And so I turned over to Freddie, and Freddie turned and asked, Kevin, what is, what was the gospel of his salvation? And it hit him, he didn't know. And that night he trusted the Lord. Well, listen to what the verse says. If you're new on this program, you listen to what this says. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them or lost. If you don't know the gospel of your salvation, you're lost. And if you're lost, you don't have to be. The reason you're lost is verse four, in whom the godless world hath blinded the minds of which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Remember, the will of God is for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God would not back up for a second to save you if you wanted to be. And when I say saved, what you're doing is you're trusting what God did 2,000 years before you are born. He already did it. He finished it. Complete. The completeness is, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There was a moment in time, a moment, when I trusted Christ. Why? I heard it. I heard it from a gift that was given to me, a preacher. A gift name was E.C. Moore. He brought the gospel to me. He was in my gift, and I never deny that he was a gift. And after that, I began to preach. 
and I became people's gift and didn't know it. Began to study Ephesians and found out I was a gift. A gift that will give you something. And you won't even have to do anything for it. Oh, what a message of grace. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to support me. You don't have to do anything. And there's one thing you can put in the bank. Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day. And if you want to trust that, God will seal you with that Holy Spirit promise. And unless you hear that, you can't trust it. So if you hear it, you heard it from a gift. And that gift told you why. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be a God and not of us. I never saved anybody in my life. The gospel of Christ did. And to hear that glorious gospel every time is so good. I never get tired of hearing it, nor do I ever get tired of preaching it. Why? Because it's power. It's God's power of saving a wretch like me. It's God's power to complete the operation for me. It's God's power to show me the faith of his son and how that the faith of his son was enough. Turn to Galatians one more time. In Galatians chapter 2 again, verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Why, is he, why do I know he's alive? Because he's raised from the dead. He rose again. He was alive. He died. He rose again. He's alive. He's alive and seated at the right hand of the Father. And he lives in me. Does he live in you? Look at first. Uh, hold on to Galatians. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Your body right now, Jesus dwells in, in your mind. And your mind can say what it believes. If I ask people, what's the gospel of your salvation? Most of them don't know. I can ask them if they're saved, and they'll lie about that. But to get put on the spot, what's the gospel of your salvation? You don't know. And if you don't know, you got a serious problem. What is it? You're lost. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. That is to me wonderful. God doesn't see me the way I am. He sees his son in me. That is the biggest blessing. I'm telling you what, to know me. I know me. People see the outward me. They don't know the inward me. You can't see the inward me. Nobody can see the inward you. They see the outward you, and they judge your outwardness of you in your sins and your attitude and all that, but they can't see that inward man, that inward man. Look in Romans 7. Now watch. In Romans chapter 7, verse uh, 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members war against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched mind that I am, that's a fight. It's, it's sorrow. I can't do what I really want to do with God because I've got this sorry body. But that's okay because that sorry body can glorify God and not get glory itself. You see, if I was perfect inside and outside, I would probably get a lot of glory. And God and his son probably wouldn't be seen. But instead, oh, wretched man that I am, with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the law of the body, the law of sin. And so as I walk in this flesh, I'm not in the flesh. I'm in Christ. I'm seated at the right hand of the Father in Christ. He's there. I'm there in him. It's all set up. It's done. It's completed. And if I leave this world, when this body gives up, I go to be with the Lord and the Father, and I go to sleep. And as I'm asleep one day, he's going to wake me up. And the people down here alive are not going to prevent me from coming down. 
but the people that are alive, they can have their vile body changed. How do I know Philippians 3.21? Their vile body can be changed and they can be caught up together to meet me if I'm there or I can be caught up together over them if I'm alive to meet them. And we'll ever be together with the Lord as I walk my life. I'm ever with him. I have eternal life, which is forever. Forever. I'm always with him eternally. Ever. I'm ever with him. Nothing can separate me. I, I, I want you to go back to Romans 8. Look with me in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Things are going right. I don't separate you from God. As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. They and all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's First that's, uh, First Corinthians 15, 55, 56 in that area. For I'm persuaded that neither death, death don't separate me from God. It unites me with God. If I go to sleep in the Lord, I want to be with the Father. If I'm alive, I don't prevent them which are asleep. If God says it's time for them to come down and meet, why? He's going to put the body together one day, alive and asleep. He's going to put them together in Christ. It's all been done in God's mind in Christ. When Christ ascended out of hell and went to the Father, he took us as it was the whole body up there and presented to the Father holy and without blame before him in love. It's like it's on a ledger, and that ledger has your name on it. And it's like the ledger we call the book of life. So if you trust the gospel to your salvation, you're in the book of life. And if you're in the book of life, look what it says. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. Those are the things that are coming after you. Those are the things things are trying to corrupt you. Those are the things that are trying to bewitch you. Those are the things that are trying to hinder you. Those are the things that are trying to condemn you. Look, look back in Romans uh, 8, verse 31. What should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. There's nobody can lay anything to your charge. You're holy without blame before him in love. If you just trust the gospel of your salvation. Christ died for our sins, according to scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to scripture. Isn't that simple? It's called the simplicity of Christ. Is there a moment in your life when you actually trusted that forever? Did you quit trying? Quit trying to get right with God. Quit trying to clean it up. Quit trying to confess your sins. And just for the first time, rested. Had peace. Didn't worry about it anymore. Didn't have to. It was done long before we were born. It was long before you were born that somebody else paid the price. Uh, look with me again in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price, the blood of Christ. You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Give him the glory. Ephesians 1.12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for knowing how to save me. But thank you, Lord, that you did. Not only did you know how to save, and no long, and not only did it belong to you, Psalm 3, 8, salvation belongs to the Lord, you accomplished it in your son. You operated on me, Father. 
You cut me away from my body in Christ. You baptized me into death in Christ. You put me in hell. My sins are there, no longer to be seen, burnt up. And you raised me when you forgave me, because when you forgave me, you raised his son. Your son came up to you, and he presented me to you as his. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians 2. Verse 9. As is written, I have not seen or heard, neither entered the heart of man, the things which God had prepared for them that love him. How do I love you, God? I love you because you love me. I love you, God, because you saved me. I love you, God, because you sealed me. I love you, God, because you're the creator and nothing can bother what you did. It's done. In verse uh, 10, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. The spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, that's the spirit of the devil, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teach comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. If you're in the dark still, what we said tonight, you're a natural man and you will die in death. You don't have to. God don't want you to. God made provision for you not to. And he preached to you tonight. Maybe tonight's the night and day of your salvation. I don't know. But whatever. You need to trust. Amen.